So, uh, Chalmers uh, 1, 2, 3 was uh, a brilliant comedy series from uh, the late 80s. Um, we're very, very lucky to... 1980s. From the 1980s, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we're very lucky to have revived it with Hattrick and uh, Spiteful Puppet. Um, and I have here with me three of the main stars of the show. So, I'll just introduce this. this is Jimmy Mulville. Hello, Jimmy. Hello, Barnaby. Uh, Rory McGrath. Hello, Rory. Hello, Barnaby. And Philip Pope. Hello, Philip. Hello, Jeremy. Been Sorry, bit, Barnaby. We're all physical then. I know it's you good. Know, just just, so people know who we are. It's miming, isn't it? It's yeah. good. Um, and you've also got your names on the screen, which is quite handy. Ah, uh, yes. Which is good. Um, so, I mean, the first question I really should ask is, um, is how, how did you all first meet? How did you uh, become friends uh, and meet for the first time? We're not, we're not friends. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I more of a question, uh, not so much how as why. <laughs> was it the first time I met you, Phil, it might, it might have been the latest time, but I'm, I think I was walking down the street and uh, you said, big issue, sir, to me. And Yeah, that's right. I, yeah. I, luckily, I had some spare change on me in those days. <laughs> uh, and I gave some to you and got paper, yeah. Yeah. Was it was the first time yeah. I saw you, was that? And no, I'm keep mixing up with Angus Deaton, sorry. <laughs> e easily done. I first met Rory when... We were barely out of nappies. Uh, we were quite old, but we just had an incontinence problem. Uh, and um, he came round to my house. He was sent round to my flat, my little uh, flat in Martin Street, by the then president of Footlights called Chris Keatley, who was from Middleborough. And he said uh, that we should work together on coming up with material for Footlights. And Rory arrived on my doorstep um, with more hair than he's got now. And a kind of slightly thinner face, um, and uh, but most crucially, with three cans of was it Stella or was it Carlsberg? It's probably Carlsberg Special. Um, yeah, Carlsberg get, Special, lovely. You can get them for twenty eight p in the college bar. You see, that's why. I thought he was the man for me. And, uh, and did you ask me why I only had three? It's not, obviously I drank one of the four on the way. Yes, around. no, I, I blocked the three immediately. I thought, hmm, mm. it's going to be difficult. <laughs> Um, and then Phil, I met a couple of years later um, in seven, 1978, I think Phil was it? Uh, eight or nine, I can't remember exactly. I think yeah, it was seventeen nine at the Edinburgh Festival, yeah. And Phil was doing a very dreary sketch show. Um, oh, thank you. Written by Richard Curtis. No, it wasn't dreary. It was very it's hilarious. Uh, by Richard Curtis and Angus Deaton called Radio T. And it's a parody of the then newly formed commercial radio stations. And... It was full of hilarious um, parodies of uh, the things you could find on the commercial radio. But actually, the the biggest number in the show was Phil's uh, song, uh, which was parodying the Bee Gees, called Meaningless Songs in Very High Voices, which I think reached a, a, quite a heady number in the charts, didn't it? Yeah, it was, um, we, it was very big in Australia, but we were always quite big down under. But um, the BG, strangely enough, didn't like it, just despite it being called meaningless songs in very high voices. Mm. But, um, and I suggested to Angus Deaton, I, I went backstage and I said, hello, I'm a BBC radio producer, which I was masquerading as in those days. And I said, um, I think it's a great show and we should do it on the radio because it was a radio show. I was quite lazy. I thought it's very, quite easy to just boil this thing <laughs> on the radio. I said, well, but what if year I, was that, Jim? What year was that? 78, 78. So would you say... Did I think say, it was 79, actually. 79. No, let's not bigger. Um, <laughs> okay. Would you say, Phil, that your career sort of gone downhill since that meeting? In well, I, well yeah. <laughs> I, 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 it would be churlish of me to say that. But, uh, you know, it's, it was, it's been fun anyway, since. But I, I said to Angus Deacon, you should put that song at the end because it's a showstopper and they'll go out on a high, the audience will go out on a high because it's in the middle of the show at the moment and you're getting a nice good round of applause. But if it goes out at the end, you do an encore and everyone thinks you're brilliant. And Angus said, it's impossible. It's like trying to edit Beethoven. <laughs> so I made a mental note of the young man who was saying this, uh, just to, uh, I kind of had my card marked by that remark. And, um, and that's how we all met. So did that become radioactive on the, yeah, that, be did. that became radioactive on on BBC Radio Four. Yeah, which is very quite a, a jolly successful radio yeah. show. Yeah, we did seven series, I think, and a few specials. Yeah. Um, not all of them produced by Jimmy, sadly. No, but... three, of them were, three of them were good series. <laughs> <laughs> 
So yeah, the you, last three. <laughs> <laughs> you did all work together on TV on a sketch show called "Who Dares Wins." Was that that was yeah. the first time you all worked together as a as a trio? Was it? Yeah, I think so. We uh, yeah. we actually had uh, the "Who Dares Wins" developed out of two pilots we did for Thames. It was called Quirt. <laughs> Remember that? Yes. Quirt, which is a sketch show. Were you involved in that film? I think you were, weren't you? I was, yeah. I think the idea behind Quirt, calling it Quirt, was because uh, you know it was supposed to be a mainly a writers' show. I think the writers who had worked on Not an Icon News were getting a bit pissed off by the fact that you know they weren't getting the credit or things were being changed, so they wanted to be in charge of their own destiny. And so, of course, Quirt is are the first five uh, keys on the on the uh, keyboard. So they are well, not the piano keyboard, obviously. But anyway, uh, I didn't write Quirt, as you can tell. So uh, I'll pass it back to the writers. But strangely, Andy Hamilton, who was one of the prime movers behind Quirt and then Who Does Wins, is one of one of Greece's and a prolific writer. Doesn't use a, doesn't use a typewriter. He writes everything long, longhand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's only got one thumb. So it's no true. So it's quite it's true. It's quite um. It's you know it. it, it, it he said to me, it kind of. I don't think he thought he's the world's worst hitchhiker. He kind of wrote, yeah. We can only go one way. <laughs> Chris Chris Langham said that he knew he was going to get fired from um, the pilots of Have a of of, um, of not the Night Club News, which he was Julie, because as he was as he was walking onto the studio floor for the pilot, Andy Hamilton said, "Good luck." <laughs> <laughs> That's a good uh, yes. That's a good audio gag. That one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And Andy, I'm not being filmed. This is all on audio. For, for the listener, Jim, Jimmy put up his right fist without a thumb sticking up in a gesture of good luck and goodwill. Yes. I forgot this was audio. I wouldn't have bothered. Well, um, no, it's. Uh, my hair. My hair. <laughs> Some of it yeah. will be used as a, as a visuals. That's right. But Andy Hamilton's just uh, recently released a book, which I have, of the of, of him writing. Long a, yeah. It's called no, Longhand, and, yeah. Andy's brilliant, and he's a fantastic writer. And, Very uh, funny writer, and he's but, played a few he's got, parts in um, Chelmsford. Yeah. Yeah. He's not a bad actor either, yeah. No. Well, I believe yeah. Andy script edited the second series, didn't he? Yeah. Yes. Keep us in check. Ah, and, cool. he, and he used to do the warm-up for as well. He's a, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a bit of a, he does his own stand-up. Um, why are we advertising Andy's work? Anyway, <laughs> why, <laughs> and why isn't he in this podcast? We, we soon <laughs> stopped that, because uh, obviously he was getting bigger laughs in the script. But, <laughs> <Yeah. anyway. laughs> <laughs> so from who dares wins how, what was yeah. the process going into chelmsford one two three what because that was a very topical sketch show um and mm. obviously chelmsford set in in uh one two three ad so um what, what what was your thinking about you know was it your decision or did the channel four come to you and say have you got a something we can do or how did yeah, it work? i think that the um homes associates <coughs> was the homes associates was a production company that yeah. uh, produced Who Dares Wins, which Jimmy was involved, and Denise O'Donoghue, and we decided we'd set up a, a, a new company to have more control over projects we were doing. So Hattrick was set up, and um, we wouldn't really have a project to do, so we sort of, out of the blue, I think, you know, five minutes before going to see the head of Light Entertainment at Channel 4, we were sort of walking up Charlotte Street saying, let's do um, it's a sitcom, sitcom, yeah, yeah, we're not an ordinary sitcom, something really different. Uh, how about historical? Yes, historical sitcom, that'll do, yeah, yeah. What, 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 what part of history? Oh, fuck. Um, well, which part of history do you know? Well, we were both the classics. Oh, yeah, Roman, how about Roman British sitcom? That's a good idea, that's a good idea. We're getting the lift by this stage, you know. And it could be set in England, and uh, it could be about the Romans being the posh guys and the British being all the common people and their interaction and all that, that bollocks, the lift opens and we go into this meeting and say, well, we're doing a, a Roman British sitcom set in uh, Chelmsford. So oh, that's a great idea, yeah, let's do that. Phew. And, I would admit that, and we want the main parts to be played by Griffiths Jones and Mel Smith. Oh, so it wasn't you two uh, originally? No, it was originally. We had uh, Mel for Bad, Bad Rock and Griff for Owlers. So that's Mel for me, uh, right. uh, Griff for, for Jimmy. And uh, Mike Bolland said, oh, no, fuck those two. You two do it yourself. So we did, which is sort of why I do Bad Rock. Like, like, it's like a Mel Smith character, yeah, because Bad Rock sort of talks like that. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I ever act playing Owlers in homage to Griff. <laughs> 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 that's a bit harsh but no, maybe not but um, so <laughs> yeah. well talking of your characters can you give us a very brief 
description of the character you play and and sort of and their character within the sitcom well i think i think i think about alice and bad Bob is they're both stupid wide boys who think they're very clever and they both think they're clever than the other person so that is you know they're sort of they're sort of ridiculously stupid in in slightly different ways i think they're always trying to get the you know, get one over on the other one and failing and that's... Phil's character, Gracientus, is a kind of oily, uh, mm -hmm. Aulus's brother-in-law, who you would think being a Roman would be on Aulus's side, but he absolutely hates his brother-in-law. Yeah, his... he's, and he's, uh, I, I always thought of him as a sort of um, Uriah Heap type character, you know, he's sort of, as in the name, that's Gracientus. Very good impression of Uriah Heap. He's, he's greasy and, and oily and, and pretty unpleasant character uh, so uh, so tight cast really <laughs> you left, left that sexual pervert as well phil oh yes thanks thanks i forgot that one yeah and there are aside from the three of you as main characters there's a couple of other main characters uh neil pearson uh yeah. plays mungo who um who is obviously bad vox second we, in command should we say we tried to destroy neil's career very early on uh, <laughs> he's a fantastic actor neil as you went on to demonstrate with you know he played big leading parts on in BBC dramas, but he um, didn't we 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 auditioned him when he was quite new, wasn't it? I think he was unheard of uh, when we auditioned him, and he I, we had, had in in mind to play Munger, who's as, as fast talking as you say, second in command to Matt Badrock, and we wrote the scenes out containing me and Munger, Badrock and Munger, and we gave them to Neil in the audition, and I we said to him, "Do you want to sit away for half an hour and go through them?" He said, "No, no." I was like, oh, oh, okay. But you, you know, save you coming to them cold and you know, just give yourself a bit of, you know. He said, no, no, that's no, fine. <laughs> but we did it and he did it perfectly. He did it just I, exactly as we'd heard it. He did it and it was marvelous. And we, I don't know if we actually said, you've got the part. That's it. We're not seeing anyone else. We, and also, we, we, we were rather attracted by a very similar um, lack of preparation that we would employ it. So, uh, <laughs> we we didn't want to work we didn't want to work with anybody who would put us to shame by actually doing any any kind prep. Of, as you found out on the day Barnaby when <laughs> I kept laughing out loud at the jokes that I should have read the night before but couldn't really be bothered. Well, the jokes you should have read in 1986. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, Neil, Neil has uh, has very good comic timing. Um so at least that's one out of four. <laughs> yeah, no, he's great. Did he come to the audition with the moustache? Because he has a massive handlebar moustache in the audit. Was it was it grown in for the character? All I can remember in, the, in what he was wearing very baggy white trousers, like a sort of like a sort of a sailor from HMS Pinafore. That's all I can remember. And he also carried very large, thick, learned tomes around with him, books that he would read um, uh, when he, we were rehearsing. And of course, now he's a very um, very well known um, book. Can I say dealer or book? Thief. Book thief. <laughs> <laughs> Worm. Yeah. No, he's, uh, and then, of course, we had Howard Lou Lewis playing Blag. Mm. Um, R.I.P. God bless him. Who, who died um, uh, after we finished the recording. So he, he had good timing. At least. Yeah. Uh, but he, he was, was lovely. He was another character who, was, who, who actually was exactly like. I mean, I don't think he wrote it for him, but he sort of. We, he played a character was it Elmo was it in a, another sitcom called Brushstrokes? Uh, yes, the gentle giant, and it was just that was the character. We could we'll write it for, we write it like that character, and um, he was a friend of a friend of ours. And he said, "Why don't you get him in and do it?" And so Howard came in, and it was perfect. Mm. And in the or, the audio version, sadly, obviously Howard's no longer with us. Uh, Philip does uh, the most amazing impression of he does uh, and you barnaby i can now reveal do a fantastic version of well you're not really a version of jeff mcgiven but you start you do a wolfbane that i think is up there with jeff mcgiven's wolfbane wouldn't you agree chap oh yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely. Right, okay. you you've got the same welsh accent that veers off to gateshead and hyderabad yeah via bradford <laughs> yeah it's fantastic it takes you on a, a a whirlwind of three continents before you land back in Cardiff. I think there was one scene in the audio recording recently when there were four 
northerners in the same room. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like it was like accent arm wrestling. So oh, you're going to you're going to northeast, though. I'm going to go northwest. Then I'm going. It was I, very yeah. peculiar. I went for a walking tour with my character, but um, <laughs> but we, that's also uh, we have introduced um, Patterson Joseph, who's a great uh, actor, yeah. and he came late to this because we'd already recorded our stuff and he plays um uh, uh sorry he plays functio yeah Functio's um, scriptoris. and that's the, your sort of first assistant uh for, for the roman governor but he he recorded his lines uh in isolation on his own and uh we know isolation means <laughs> yes <Yeah. somebody laughs> explained it. But but having um, listened to them you couldn't you couldn't tell yeah. he was on his own yeah. And he, he loved it. He, he, he did it very, very, very well. Yeah, he sounded as if he was in the room with us. He yeah. thought it was very, very funny, which was lovely. He was, uh, and, and he was the, great. The, cha the chaps that recorded him in the studio, they all emailed to say we had such a good time reading the script. Uh, it was just really oh, great. It was lovely. Well, I, I have to say, when I listened back to the first episode, I was really, honestly, I thought the production of it was a fantastic one of the anime. And I'll say that again without the hint of surprise in my voice. <laughs> <laughs> it was a it was fantastic i thought you did a, a brilliant job because not only are you stars of the show of course you produce it well it's exactly. nice, it's just nice to be able to do it i mean it was one of those shows that i absolutely loved uh when i was younger and i just thought it was a real shame that it ended when well, it did two series but i didn't know whether you had an idea for the third series or you just decided well, we'll it, cut it, it shortly it was a bit, it was quite expensive and Michael Gray wanted to spend all the money on Jonathan Ross. So they, they've only got a limited amount of money, these broadcasters. And, um, and they backed up the money truck to Jonathan's house. Uh, <laughs> that we do the, uh, what's it called? The last resort? And uh, no, he we did it. It was started off as a three, three times a week chat show. Didn't it? Yeah. The ludicrous early evening chat show. I'm broadcast, you know, really for that time of day. Um, so there was obviously no uh, room for any comedy. <laughs> <laughs> Just let that one hang there for in case Jonathan's listening. And yeah. Chelsea, it wasn't a cheap show to do because we did, we did lots of um, exterior. We, in fact, we did a, a couple of night shoots down in French in French and Pond. Oh God, tell me about it. Um, which were uh, you know very expensive because uh, lots of extras dressed in Roman costume and ancient British costume. With we had. Uh, rain towers which for people who don't know what that is huge kind of long poles out of which pours all this water so it looks like it's raining uh, which was so, it just came from french and ponds itself it was actually yeah first. made you realize one of the things that i learned is that stagnant water pumped out of a pond up a rain tower is colder than rainwater itself yeah to mm. write that down oh yes yeah. i'm going now well so <laughs> i mean that's that uh, that to me is why it's sort of a, a series that you can watch and watch again because it, it is it does look expensive it doesn't look you know you're not studio bound all the time we were, we were the only cheap things in it <laughs> yeah. and, we, and we had to borrow we had to hire the tardis from the bbc uh yeah, yeah. Most expensive prop known to yeah. man the tardis yeah that is a great gag at the uh, Very expensive when you set fire to it by mistake yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, certainly not a cheap guy no, but it was very good. Um, but we but may I say something? May I say something um, about the music? Because uh, which is the work of Philip Pope. I know he's too shy to bring it up himself. But I, I, when, when I listened back to the the audio the, with the podcast we've just done, I was re you know, reenthused by the music, which I think is excellent. I think that's some of your finest work, Phil. I've Thank fine. you. Yes, <laughs> yes, and the, and that's the best thing I've done. And that was thirty two years ago. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I have to say that I'm being being I, I like music and I'm interested in music, but I just I, I'm actually no good at it. So, but but uh, oh, said, pish pish. I said to, I said to Phil, um, I want something that's a cross between this is how pretentious I was in those days. A cross between Carlos Carmina Burana and Janicek Sinfoniata. Just put them together, you know, and make it all sort of Romany. And do you know what? It incredibly, it, it Phil went away for about um, six, eight weeks, did fuck all, and then the night before the music was needed, he came up with exactly what I said. When I heard it, I said, "Yeah, it's perfect." I didn't. Well, think, I, I didn't want to. Say, oh, Phil, can you can you do this? That I said that's what I wanted, and that's what it was. And I said, "Yeah, it's great, perfect." Right. How difficult was it to recreate it, Philip? Because I know there wasn't any uh, master tapes of it available or anything or any score so was that a difficult thing to have to recreate from memory 
Uh, well, it wasn't just from memory. I uh, had I did have the, uh, the the actual episodes of uh, of the original series to remind me but uh, uh no it was all it, it did come back to me and and then i came up with a few new bits um but actually it was all done pretty much these days you know, in the old days when we actually did the original thing i had all sorts of extraordinary sort of uh old instruments great big drums and um and a thing called a theorbo which is like a massive great lute with a long um uh, fretboard, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and at this point, Phil is gesturing wildly. With hands. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I am. But it's a very and, catchy tune, so and trumpets great. and all and what, sorts crumpet. of stuff. Crump, crump, crumb it horn. Very, it was a very, very catchy piece of music. But, but these days, of course, you you know, a we didn't have a massive budget, but also I've recreated it all using sort of virtual instruments and, and computers. That's not that interesting, but I thought I'd throw it in anyway. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an earworm. It's an earworm, isn't it? What that is coming out of your. Oh, <laughs> yes, yeah. it is. Yes. It is. For, yeah. for, for those who are not, for those who can't see, I've got an ear, an earworm coming out of my ear. <laughs> but um, was, but also, they, the, the shows were quite visual. So when you proposed that we do this, mm. I wasn't too sure whether we'd be able to kind of capture, you know, what was good about. But Rory went away and did, a, I think, a brilliant job on making them an audio experience, a podcasty experience. I thought, thought that thing, the the narration thing, was very clever and funny and clear. The thing about it is, when you're listening to it, you want it to be clear where where you are. I mean, the first rule, isn't it, as of comedy, is to be clear. Otherwise, people are confused. And not in a good way. So I thought he did a. I thought he did, he did a fantastic job on that. But sorry, can I, it was quite yeah, yeah. that respect because it, it was a very visual show. Um, and that's, that that surprised me. I hadn't actually seen it, so when I watched it, I thought, "Blimey, this is too visual for me." Uh, but it was quite fun coming from radio and sort of back to radio. It was quite yeah because you're right, quite right, Jimmy. So scene setting is very ponderous in in radio. It's very easy visually because it's, you're in someone's front room and that, you know that someone's front room. But so, but that also offers up more opportunities for for humour and verbal gags and things. So it was it was fun to do. It was fun to do. It was harder work than I expected. But then isn't everything um, <laughs> for me anyway? Uh, yeah, so but it was really rewarding. How did it feel coming back? Because we did the one session in the recording studio. How did it feel coming back and getting back into character? You, I have to say that the ease with which you all worked together and the natural acting that you did was it was amazing, and I felt it was lovely to be able to sort of be a part of that and uh, and and sort of slip in and. And also not read the scripts beforehand, so um, that was that was <laughs> yeah. exciting. Well, actually, some of us who were right, maybe writing it, and I read it loads and loads, and I read it <laughs> a lot, so I was fed up with it. But I was rather touched that Jimmy came to it fresh. You know, it was a voyage of discovery. So much. It, was very, it was very touching in a way. <laughs> See him laugh so much at stuff, which is a material, basically. You're very kind to say natural acting. It's actually lack of acting. Is uh, it's more like we were just talking to each other which is nice actually so it felt i have to say it was one of the best most fun days i've had mind you we are living through a pandemic so the bar's low <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was a fantastic day to be just in the studio with you love and um it was good and i must say uh, a shout out for the girls um mm. they, know, they know who they are <laughs> yeah, well, uh, hannah and there. kim hannah and kim hannah and kim you're a great cast you assembled at very short notice uh, Barnaby, yeah. that was superb really superb it was and nice. let me just say that i thought that the the production was just to to, to echo jimmy's comments i think it was it was great because it was it had that sort of cinematic audio quality yeah um, which which i particularly like. There's a chappy called Joseph Fox who did the sound design, and um, he, Foxy. yeah, he was. I mean, he and he loved it. He was laughing all the way through. Doing it. it was lovely to be able to bounce back and forth and and make it exactly right. And that's the the weirdest thing as well is 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 trying to make it sound cinematic and not like we're just in a studio doing stuff. But um, um, I'm just gonna ask an odd, well, not an odd question, but um, uh, apart from Charles sort of one two three, um, seven, seven inches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, only if you fold it in half. Well, I was. <laughs> are you going to say? I don't. Yeah, thirty-nine your... steps. 
which I know exactly. Um, which, which Scottish football team is nicknamed the Spiders? Is that where you're going? Is I that was. Where you're what's the oh, answer? Fuck me! How about that? I knew that would come up today. <laughs> Queens Park, of course. <laughs> Queens Park are playing the second biggest football stadium in Scotland, which is, is right? Hampden Park, which is one, yeah. one, one down from Celtic Park, which is the biggest. I can take that one off my question list. Uh, I bet you've, we've saved the recording now. We've well, um, <laughs> with your odd question. <laughs> well, I'm going to sort of wrap up the interview by asking. Uh, yes. Because Charles for 1, 2, 3 was I mean, a great success. And, and you all, and way back in, was it in 88, I think, or 89? And then, um, and then 1990. But from there, you've obviously all gone on to do other things that have been great successes as well. I didn't know if you had not any highlights but anything particularly that stands out in your career that you think oh that was a good moment or that was a that was a turning point that um that happened uh, or anything like that well i've done uh, since then i've done uh, loads of very very exciting very funny and very fabulous things uh, none of them were televised unfortunately <laughs> uh, <laughs> but there's one very peculiar thing which i bring out i've never done i won't list all the things that i've done which has been great fun and work with great people but um phil and i no you haven't <laughs> Bill, <laughs> Bill, yeah, I just know, yeah i've never worked with any nice people really uh, uh Phil and I got involved through a radio show I was doing about minority languages in Europe in the minority languages uh, <laughs> Eurovision Song Contest. Wow! And I and, and I written yeah. a song. I written a song which the producer asked me to, if I translate, get it translated into Cornish because I'm from Cornwall uh, allegedly. Uh, and so we got this um, professor in Cornwall to translate it into Cornish, and we put it together. And we, Phil and I, and the a lovely cellist called Shinos. Um, played it in front of about two or three thousand people in the national theory uh, whatever it was the metropolitan theater of udine in um northern italy where they which language are they speaking is it friuli they speak uh, 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 friulian or furlan as they call it which furlan, is yeah. anyway so venezia they were hosting it and um it was the most bizarre <laughs> the bizarre couple of days in northern italy and it was very very hard to. I remember an, an Arsenal supporting mate of mine said, What are you doing, Rory? I won't see you play. What are you doing at the moment? Well, at the moment, I'm in Udine in northern Italy, about to take part in the minority languages Eurovision Song Contest, singing the Cornish entry. <laughs> so he, he hung up on me straight away. Yeah, yeah, of course you are. Bye. <laughs> well, I have to say that actually, following on from that, and you know, thanks anyway, Rory, you get me the, the best gigs, um, was, was the fact that uh, apart from me, you know, I've done lots of things as you know you know only fools and horses this that and the other and uh but this was one of the best things that i've ever done and also to come fifth actually in in that com competition uh but we only found out why we came fifth the, the later in the lift i mean they had you know, the minority languages from all over europe and including russia and they had uh so they had to they had judges from all over Russia and we were in the Rory and I got in the lift with the Russian judge and he's he said can I just say I love your song I love your song it is brilliant beautiful beautiful song uh, but I have to mark it down because it was too short too short <laughs> and that's why we only came fifth just think if we'd made it longer i know we would have we, we, we made it longer we sang the we first, did. first <laughs> and again at the end it was still too short my idea of as jim and jimmy will take care the idea of doing performance in public is to get on do it and fuck off as quickly as possible and i thought the, i assume the audiences will think the same thing you know well we was cut back my to the bag if, I, if, I, if, I, if i'd been in the audience i said oh i like that corner shot there's only two minutes thank fuck for that <laughs> and we can get the 20 minute kazakhstan entry of you know this Talking of, talking of Cornish, it could it could it, it could segue into my um, favourite moment because it was probably the nadir of my embryonic career. Rory, one Christmas, Rory, um, uh, they got Rory to write a Christmas pantomime for Radio Four because he was a brilliant radio writer and um, and he was young and and they thought oh you know get this young guy to write the pantomime. He had Peter Cook in it. You had um, Graham Garden. You had loads of big, big comedy stars in it. Because he and I were both on staff as comedy writers. So whatever job they gave us, we had to do it because we were paid a salary in 1978 by the BBC. And I got the job 
So whilst your mate is swanning around the Paris with all these luminaries of, of stage and screen, we'd like you to go down and 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 write the script for the Wurzel's Christmas special. <laughs> I remember that. Yes, I do remember. Yeah, in in Bristol at the at the uh, at the Clifton Studios next door to a pub called the Coronation Tap. Oh, the Cory Tap. And so we had uh, we had a bunch of sketches, uh, which weren't very good. And but the Wurzels, there's only one West Country man in the Wurzels. One is a Scotsman, and the other one talks like Noel Coward. And, <laughs> and so it was a really surreal experience to begin with. But it got more and more surreal because I realised that the the kind of the order of the day was to just ship in lots and lots of jars of scrumpy into the studio. So by the end, the audience and the performers were all, and the stage management team were all completely legless. <laughs> and uh, the Nolan sisters were the guest stars. Um, and I remember my last memory was trying to get off with one of the Nolan sisters. Um, I don't think I did. I was too incapable. And I thought, I woke up the following morning, I thought, well, it'll never be as bad as that ever again. So I look forward <laughs> to my career getting... But getting actually, later, later on, Jim, didn't we... We wrote for Frankie Howard and were the guest on one of his yeah. right shows. It was the Nolan sisters. And I tried to get off of one of the Nolan sisters. <laughs> yeah. It was Bernie Nolan that I tried. Uh -huh. Chasing up the stairs. This is now arrestable nowadays, this behavior. Chasing up the stairs in the Paris studio, trying to grab our arse. <laughs> are, uh, are we actually on... Have I got news for you, Barnaby? Have you actually tried to get off with the Nolan, one of the Nolan sisters? Because I know that I haven't, so I must be the odd one out. The odd one out, yeah, definitely. <laughs> you tried to get off with one of the Nolan brothers. <laughs> uh, the Coronation Tap, great pub, but particularly if you like scrumpy. I have no memory of it whatsoever. I was completely oh. rat assed and uh, it was like, I mean, we all knew we were on a sinking ship. So it was like it was basically we were trying to euthanize ourselves before the end. You know, we were trying to. <laughs> Um, but they were jolly, the, the words. I had nothing to say against them. They were lovely people. Can I just say on Phil's behalf that, uh, in case the listeners don't know this, that Phil is actually from Bristol. So when he says, oh, the Cory Tab, that's a great pub, it doesn't mean he knows every pub in Britain. <laughs> he is actually from <laughs> Bristol, you know. I'd, I'd say to your listeners, if you've got a spare, you know, two hours over Christmas, and you will have, because, you know, you're going to be with your family. So excuse yourself and go listen to our podcast in the toilet. I mean, you, it won't make you masturbate, but it will It will actually, you know, it will divert the Christmas gloom. Yeah, it might make you throw up. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, guys. All right. Brilliant. Always good fun. Uh, 